Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Mitigate Risks in Your Emergency Department. We're pleased that you've joined us today. And before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, we have two speakers uh, from Moss Adams with us today. We have Don Isaacs, a senior manager, and Pat Onfasek, manager. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Don to get us started. Well, thank you, Amy. Appreciate uh, you coming on and getting this kicked off today. Uh, good morning for some of you and good afternoon for others. I think uh, we've got a wide variety of uh, coast times with us today, so I know that uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, my name is Dawn Isaacs. As Amy mentioned, I am a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for almost 30 years, and I've been in leadership and consulting now for quite some time. So we're happy to have you with us today. Pat, if you want to do a quick introduction. Absolutely. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are right now. Thank you for joining us. My name is Pat Ambasak, and I am a manager within our performance excellence practice. I've been with Moss Adams for a couple of years now and have been, have been helping to lead our the analytics portion of our practice. Right, so. All right. We're going to start with our overview today. Um, I want to make sure that folks can certainly make this interactive. I know it said in the in the very beginning to use the Q&A feature. We want you to do that. We want you to ask us questions and challenge us um, so that we can certainly answer anything that you have. Um, if you want to talk briefly on another topic uh, that I might be able to clarify for you towards the end of the presentation, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and knowing that not everyone on this call today isn't as clinically focused as perhaps I am, uh, please make sure you ask a question if I use an acronym that uh, you're not clear on or I haven't explained something as clearly as you'd like. Please, please make sure you, that you use the feature to get a hold of us so that we can talk a little bit more about that. So um, these are some of the things in today's overview that we're going to touch on. Um, we're going to talk about throughput issues. Uh, you guys know that. Um, we, we kind of listed that as, as one of the topics that we would really talk about. We know that that's plaguing hospitals today. So we're going to really dive into what causes those issues. Long le length of stay, patients left without being seen, borders, overcrowding. All of these things are, are really plaguing us today. 
Um, so we're going to talk about how the length of stay can really impact your bottom line, how many of your payers are leaving after they already walk in the door um, prior to their medical screening exam and what does that look like. Um, talk a little bit more again about the overcrowding and front end triage uh, piece of it. That really is something that if you clean up could really help mitigate a lot of that um, left without being seen. And the best practices or leading practices, those that um, the Emergency Nurses Association or the ED Benchmarking Alliance, those types of leading practices are, are mentioning for us today. We're going to talk about some of those. And then we're going to talk about appropriate uh, productivity benchmarking. That's a lot of the work that we do as well. And borders can really cause um, some issues when it comes to that. So we want to talk to you a little bit about how you can do that appropriately to make sure that you're benchmarked with other hospitals similarly. So here's our agenda. We're gonna talk about a current ED operating environment, the journey through the emergency department from a patient's perspective, um, things that are impacting your ED from staffing to, to providers to the discharge, things like that. So we'll, we'll try and cover the whole process. Um, we're gonna talk about how Moss Adams might be able to help you if, it's, if you're interested in us coming in and helping you with a project. And then we'll, of course, have questions. You don't have to wait to the end. Please, um, again, offer those questions throughout uh, the hour. So current reality, those of you that work in the hospital systems or specifically work in the emergency department know that this slide alone could go on and on. Um, there's, there's lots of issues plaguing the emergency department, um, but we certainly know that, that COVID um, really kicked it off uh, for us here in the last few years it really kind of heightened all of the inefficiencies that um, an ER had prior to COVID. Um, so uh, that, that really has become an issue. Um, we haven't been able to clean all of that up. In addition to the exacerbation of acute health conditions in our population today, we know the population is aging. We know that they hadn't uh, patients hadn't been seeking medical care for quite some time. So these types of things are really, really starting to continue to cause impacts in the emergency department. We also know that primary care providers or urgent cares in your local communities uh, is, is really one of the, the root causes of some of these issues. Um, primary care providers are really hard to um, get to come to your area and set up their offices. So we know that lack of PCPs in the area can really uh, plague your emergency department. Community resources, of course, can also cause your some of your patients to come back often. Food insecurity being one of them, um, and then behavioral health, the crisis that we have today with um, behavioral health patients uh, can really cause some issues within your emergency department. We talked about COVID, we talked about a little bit of your inefficiencies. Um, fast track, I'm gonna spend some time on fast track or low acuity uh, today. Um, a lot of organizations that have a high volume of patients per day do have a fast track, but are you really using it efficiently? Are you executing the way that a fast track should be? That's an area that will really save you a lot of time and nursing and provider hours. So we're gonna talk about that. And then of course the staffing shortages and turnover in your clinicians, your lab, your rad, it's really um, all of your hospital system that is also causing some of these issues. So it looks like we have our first polling question. I'm gonna kick it over to you, Amy. All right, thank you. So the polling questions are located right on the slides that we're presenting. Um, so make sure you have those open. So the first one is from your perspective, what is the number one issue in your emergency department currently? And your options are staff turnover, loss of revenue, boarding and capacity, high metrics related to length of stay, and less without being seen, something else, all of the above, or unsure or not applicable. And then you're gonna to wanna to click the, the button next to the answer you choose and make sure to hit submit. And this one has quite a few options, so you might have to scroll down to see that submit button. We'll leave this up for another five seconds to make sure everyone can get their CPE.
All right, here are the results. All right, looking at some of these results, uh, staff turnover hits, I think, the top of the list. Yep, 23.9%. That certainly is, is something that is extremely challenging, especially in an emergency department when education and orientation, getting a, a new employee or even a new graduate up and running um, can take a significant amount of time. So that, that is something that um, is really affecting our, our hospitals today. Uh, boarding and capacity and all of the above. So yeah, those those are the top three. I, I'm not surprised um, of those that were picked. So thank you for um, giving us that information. So let's talk about a really simplified version of the arrival process or the journey of a patient. Um, again, the arrival process, triage, the front end, uh, kind of what we call it in the emergency department is something that's that's really, um, really you could you could lose a lot of patients there. There's a lot of high risk there, um, and and there's some really, I would want to say simple things that we can do to clean that up to really make sure that this process works the way it the way it should. So when the patient arrives in the ED, most of the clinicians know that the patient time starts then. It doesn't start later down the road, once the patient passes the threshold of your door, they are now your patient. So the first risk really is what if the patient doesn't even walk up to the triage desk or what if nobody sees the patient when they first walk in? That's a risk area in itself. The patient could walk in and then walk to the restroom right away. Um, those again are things that you wanna make sure that your front end folks are really paying attention to those people, anybody who's walking in your door. You'd hate to have somebody collapse in your bathroom in your waiting room and you not know those types of things. So that's really your first risk is when your patient arrives and knowing that even though the patient isn't technically in your uh, electronic health record, they're your patient. So um, the patient should be quick regged and triaged pretty quickly. Uh, so these can happen simultaneously. They could happen one before the other. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the risks that kind of go along with each step with that. But your quick reg process is typically done by a registrar if you're an emergency department that has a decent amount of volume. And that might be your very first touch point, or it could be triage where typically there's a registered nurse sitting there. The registered nurse sometimes can act as a registrar, sometimes they don't. Sometimes this happens in tandem, sometimes quick reg happens first, but all of these things need to happen fairly quickly among the, or upon the patient arrival. So once that's done, um, the medical screening exam somewhere along the journey takes place. So after you've seen the patient, the nurse, the registrar seen the patient, then the provider will see the patient or the qualified medical personnel um, to perform a medical screening exam. After the medical screening exam is done, and that's, that's something that we, that's really key terms in an emergency department is an MSC or a medical screening exam. That's uh, a piece that goes with EMTALA. An MSC needs to be performed or else you could have some EMTALA violations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide uh, with some more risk. The provider, of course, after they've uh, done the medical screening exam, they're gonna uh, order some treatment, whatever it may be. Um, and then they're gonna provide potentially a disposition right then, or maybe a little bit later, they're gonna discharge the patient or they're gonna uh, choose to admit the patient. Of course, if the patient's ill enough that you need labs and radiology and things like that, they'll review those results and then come back and then make that decision as well. But that all happens kind of in the back end of what we would call the treatment process. So this slide really uh, illustrates all of the risk areas along the journey. Um, I talked a little bit about the arrival of the patient and how that in itself can be a, an extremely critical piece to pay attention to, making sure that you know every patient that arrives or every person the person might not even be a patient seeking health, um, you know, health workup, but somebody might have walked into your waiting room or, or in through your doors. You really need to be investigating what they're doing there. Again, we talked about quick reg and triage. The piece to really uh, to take away with the quick reg is we call it quick reg because it should really be quick reg. You should only be asking two or three elements, um, name, date of birth, 
and hopefully everyone knows that this is not where you ask about a payer source. This is not where you ask insurance information and things like that. That is also what we would consider an EMTALA violation. All patients have the right to be treated once they come into the emergency department. A payer source and uh, the rest of a full registration happens later in the, um, in the journey for the patient. So make sure that your reg folks, um, it, if they don't report up through you specifically in the emergency department, make sure they at least have the education on how that is supposed to work through the patient's journey so that you don't have any unnecessary risk there. So, um, so the patient, if they've been regged and triaged, uh, again, they'll go to the medical screening exam. Some of those, some of those pieces take longer than others. And that's some of the, some of the things we're gonna talk about is the total length of stay and your arrival to dock or your door to dock times. So medical screening exam is what your timestamp for your doctor would be. And we want that to be pretty short. The ED Benchmarking Alliance actually has metrics related to that on where you should be landing. Um, and, and everybody, I shouldn't say everybody's different, but uh, your, your uh, benchmark would be different based on your size and things like that. So it's not a one size fits all. Um, it could be if you're a level one, level two trauma, things like that. So that metric isn't the same for everybody, but that's a really, really important metric because your door to doc or door to medical screening exam is when you're most likely to lose your patients or have patients that are left without being seen. So again, that's another huge risk point. And then once the medical screening exam is performed by the qualified medical professional, we call them QMPs, it doesn't have to be a provider. Um, you wanna make sure that the treatment plan starts as quickly as possible if the physician has dropped orders or entered orders. So once again, that time element doesn't get too long where a patient is frustrated and leaves your emergency department. Um, so to talk a little bit more about EMTALA, for those of you that aren't as familiar with that, again, that's a, a phrase that anyone that works in an emergency department would um, would really be aware of. Um, there's a lot of training that goes into it. It's a government mandated law, which basically it has a several different meanings. Um, it was started in the 1980s as an anti-dumping law. Um, other hospitals were just bringing patients to big hospitals and just dumping them off without any communication and things like that. So um, there's several different pieces of EMTALA. One of them is that everyone has the right to a medical screening exam, uh, regardless of payer source. So that piece has to make sure that you have that um, figured out with your registration staff. Um, every patient gets a medical screening exam. I mentioned that. Um, you have to stabilize all your patients that have an emergency medical condition after a screening exam has been completed. And then at times you have to transfer patients out and you have to do some paperwork in regards to whether or not they're stable or unstable, things like that. So it can be really tricky. Um, it can, you can have some really big fines if for any reason uh, you violate EMTALA. So I would just uh, caution you and, and ask that you do some additional education annually in regards to EMTALA. And then when I talk a little bit about performing the medical screening exam, by a qualified medical professional, so that's an MSE by a QMP, you need to make sure that your bylaws in your organization have your qualified medical professionals listed on who can perform them. So you can have nurse practitioners, PAs, um, some EDs have SANE nurses, things like that, that can perform this, but you need to make sure those are in your bylaws. So that's just another risk element um, and you might wanna be checking into those. So throughput issues are so interconnected. You know, one can cause the other, which causes the other. So, you know, in the, in the poll that we just took, staffing or not enough or poorly trained can cause increased patient and staff dissatisfaction because of the constant turnover. The patients can recognize staff that are newer and not as fast or unable to explain treatment processes, overcrowding, everything is just all interconnected and that's really what this is trying to illustrate here. So let's break this down just a little bit more. Let's talk about overcrowding. So really think about what the root cause of your overcrowding is. 
For those organizations that have significant overcrowding, typically we're seeing that they also have a fair amount of borders. And borders um, is kind of a newer term for holds, patient holds, um, that basically is a patient that's been admitted to the floor, but the floor is at capacity or they're at staffing constraints or whatever it may be. So they're being held or boarded in the emergency department. So we do see that um, some of the overcrowding causes uh, is boarding or can be boarding because it takes up a lot of space in the emergency department, which a lot of times doesn't have a ton of space anyway. So really consider what is your root cause of overcrowding and really think about if you don't have a boarding problem, then what could it be? Is it because that you're just not timely enough, there's not a sense of urgency, perhaps the ancillary areas that you rely on aren't um, you know, assisting and getting turnaround times timely, perhaps you're not getting ortho consults to the ER, or cardiac consults timely, so you really need to focus on what your root cause is before you can really dive into some of the fixes. But you really need to look at your overall length of stay. That is a publicly reported metric on the CMS website. Um, so I'm, I'm sure most of you folks know what that is. And if you don't know what that is, that's something that I would encourage you to know. Um, the CMS website, of course, is in the rears. I think it's at least a year. So you might have improved those metrics by now, but that is something that you um, that is really important to continue to measure. Door to dock, your first evaluation time. We talked a little bit about that. If this is a really long time, two hours, then it's a really good chance that's gonna tie directly with your left without being seen. Usually door to dock time should be, again, it's not a one size fits all because it's based on your, your capacity and your trauma level and things like that, but it should be at least less than 30 minutes. And then, you know, some, like I said, some folks don't even know these metrics. So that's really step one, overall length of stay, your door to dock time. And then what are your goals? Do you have goals related to these? I know that it's hard for staff to completely be on board with some of these ideas, um, but really, if you can improve some of those times, I always say improving time is improving safety. If you can move people in and out of your department quicker, then it's safer for everyone not to have the overcrowding. Patient and staff satisfaction, if, if you start to improve these times, you're just gonna have uh, a natural improvement of patient satisfaction. Typically, if you really dig into your NRC or whatever um, patient satisfaction tool that you might use, you'll see that timely care is one of the biggest uh, you know, complaints, if you will, in an emergency department. We see lots of grievances related to it, too much time. Um, and as you improve some of these timestamps and these time elements, you'll see the natural improvement. And again, it will happen with staff satisfaction. You're gonna dig out of some of these inefficiencies and they're gonna be set more satisfied with their job. Left without being seen, we've started to really talk about that. Uh, what is your metric related to this? Uh, the, the national average is really 3% now. We like to see it less than two. It's actually gone up a little bit in the last year or so. Um, but really, if you're really hitting it out of the park, it's less than 1%. We don't wanna see any patients leaving the emergency department once they arrived. That can be somewhat of an unrealistic goal, but less than 1% um, is really where you wanna be. Uh, but we're seeing more like three or 4%. We were just working with an organization on the East Coast and their left without being seen was 15%. So. That can be really high at times if we don't have a great front end uh, arrival process. So again, talk about why, why, is, why are patients leaving? You know, that if you really sit back, observe and think about it, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out why your patients are leaving. If you wanna do the finances related to it, the American Colleges of Emergency Physician have a left without being seen calculator on their page. And there's a couple other ones out there too, but if you just Google ASEP calculator, it will come up and it will, you'll have to plug in a few metrics and it can tell you how many thousands to millions of dollars that you're losing per week, per month, per patient, et cetera. So sometimes that can be really eye opening and, and those clinicians that are in the emergency department really trying to show executives uh, the loss of patients and the loss of revenue, this type of calculator can really be helpful for that. 
So triage, let's talk a little bit more about triage. Uh, again, really, really tough spot to be. As a nurse, I, this is my favorite part to observe. When I was a leader, I like to sit out in triage. As a consultant, I like to be out in triage. It's just, this is really where the flow and, and the fun, if you will, could take place. So are you bottlenecked? So when a patient walks in and they go to triage, and let's say that they've already been uh, quick retch, maybe quick retch sees them first. Maybe they're standing with a wow at the front door and gets them in the system, and then they walk up to triage. So what happens when the when you start to get a line? I'm sure patients that have a lot of capacity issues, they start to see a line out the door of patients. You know, we all know that patients all come at the same time. What do you do? How do you handle that? Um, so we're going to talk about some of those things here. And, and then we talk again about mitigation, who can perform triage and quick, quick reg. Do you use standing orders or provider and triage? Those are two other things to mitigate as well. Um, both of those can be very, very effective. So let's back up, I guess, and talk a little bit more about um, the true triage process. Um, I usually recommend that uh, only a select few can be a triage RN. For those of you that work in the emergency department, you know that the triage and the charge nurse completely run the ship. Those two are in constant communication. If they're not, they should be on who's arriving, the criticalness of the patients, how many are coming, et cetera, et cetera. Now we all have an electronic world, but you know the nurse that's um, helping arrive patients isn't all, always at the computer putting these folks in the system. They have to be communicating to potentially your charge nurse in the back. So I like to think if you have a bottleneck out at triage, you need to mitigate that. And that might be somebody coming out to help you, the charge nurse that might come out, the, the triage nurse might ask the charge nurse to send somebody. Um, but one of my peer consultants, uh, taught me once to think about Chick-fil-A or I think in and out. Um, so what what is Chick-fil-A or, or in and out? What do those uh, two fast food chains do when there's a bottleneck at the drive-through window? You know, they, they already bring pay people out to you. They're taking multiple orders at once. The same thing has to happen in an emergency department. If you have a line of people waiting for medical care, the last thing you want is someone to collapse in your line or things like that. You want to bring your staff from the back out to the front and get those patients in as soon as possible. One person is creating a bottleneck and that's your triage. So remember triage is a process, not a place. It does not have to be at the front of your emergency department. It's a true process. So triage can happen if you take your patients back to the room, it can happen in the waiting room, it can happen while you're standing in the doorway. Um, so make sure that you think through that and don't let triage be your bottleneck. So let's talk about standing orders or provider in triage. So some of you have probably seen that. When you have a big surge, maybe you have providers out there that are helping drop orders immediately, doing a quick assessment on a patient or a quick medical screening exam. Perhaps you put standing orders in right away for it's flu season and you have an adult that comes in that has a temp and um, increased breathing and things like that. Maybe you can drop a flu swab order right away. So those are things, two things that will also really mitigate um, long lengths of stay is that you use either one of those. Now, you may or may not use both. You could use both, you could use one or the other, but I would really recommend evaluating if your organization would would be able to handle doing one of these things. Of course, your providers, you have to get buy-in from them to bring them out into triage and to do that type of work. Um, but putting orders in basically in triage, um, it, knowing that your patient should be triaged within the first few minutes of arrival um, can really, really impact all of your risks. Those length of stay, left without being seen, et cetera. Hey, Don. Tell yeah. us a bit more, what's the difference between using having the provider in triage and having the charge nurse up front? Like how does that expedite the process? Yeah, um, I just mentioned that just a little bit. If your provider is out in triage or the PIT method, the provider mm -hmm. can drop orders immediately. Mm -hmm. Now, assuming this person is asking because um, maybe the charge nurse is coming out and you have standing orders, that might be an effective way too. But if your charge nurse is just coming out to help with triage, that's great. You want your patient triage, but the treatment process hasn't started. 
Mm-hmm. So if a if a provider is in triage, you can start the treatment process immediately, assuming that they're dropping orders as they're seeing the patient up there. Mm-hmm. Got Hopefully it. that clears it up. Mm-hmm. So here we talked a little bit about um, the triage process. Again, a select number of those that are well-trained. Um, a lot of uh, clinical staff, nurses will tell you the triage area is completely exhausting. Not an area typically for a nurse to be able to sit out there for 12 hours. Um, so we see areas do it in four hour shifts, six hour shifts. 12 hour shifts is fine if you have those that wanna do it, but keep in mind that um, you know you don't want your triage nurse to get kind of the alarm fatigue out there and you want her to stay, him or her to stay extremely accurate. So. Uh, minimize your shifts if you need to, and then uh, make sure that they have the proper education. Just putting the most experienced nurse out in triage is not the answer. Uh, There's a lot of uh, educational tools out there today. I would really recommend making sure that you get a class in. Um, You can outsource your triage education if you need it. Um, I know Triage First and ENA has different triage classes. I would highly, highly recommend that those triage nurses have the additional training. It should not just be someone willy-nilly that you pulled from the back and it's their first first shift out there and they haven't had any additional training. You're really elevating your risk when those types of things happen. Um, You may have to educate all of your staff, and you really probably should, Um, probably not to the links of an ENA class or triage first, but most nurses will still need to have triage training because, like I mentioned, triage is a process, not a place. So if an ambulance rolls in, they don't typically go through triage. They're bedded in the back, and the nurse that's assigned to the patient will arrive in the patient's room and perform triage. Or you could have your charge nurse um, do that if they're just a triage, if they're a triage trained nurse as well. But um, just make sure that this is something that everyone takes really serious. This will improve a lot of your efficiencies as well, because we know that triage drives the order in which patients are seen by providers. So um, if you're using ESI and you're and you're marking that your patients are sick, the docs are going to see them sooner, et cetera. We talked about uh, triage and quick reg. I would make sure that your charge nurse and your triage nurses can perform the quick reg process if you have a strong registration staff that normally do it. Uh, Charge and triage should also be able to perform this in addition to your registration staff, um, just again to help with the flow. Perhaps the reg got pulled out somewhere or things like that. You don't want your arrival process to stall because your registrar has has been removed for a short time. Uh, We talked a little bit about standing orders or provider and triage. Um, Standing orders can be a little bit tricky from an organizational standpoint and, and a CMS standpoint. Uh, So you really need an expert in this type of work to make sure that the standing orders are written appropriately and used appropriately. Um, Standing orders have been around for years in the ED world for ordering EKGs and things like that, that patients arrive with chest pain, you know, that that all makes sense. But now there's more and more standing orders out there to to continue to improve the efficiencies. So I would encourage you to... um, really have a robust list of standing orders um, that your nurses can drop if patients meet a certain criteria. Again, that helps get the treatment plan rolling for a patient, you know, lab work, urines, things like that. That way the results are coming back, potentially by the time the provider's seeing. So um, that that's a really great way to mitigate if your providers aren't interested in coming up and working in triage or perhaps uh, the provider in triage really isn't a, a workflow that would, would work for your organization. Um, I'm a proponent of hallway beds as much as most people really don't want hallway beds. Um, the, the reality of it is uh, there's more patients than space most of the time in big ERs especially. Um, you heard me talking uh, earlier about the risk in a waiting room. I think waiting rooms can be super risky. So if you're not using hallway beds and putting your patients back out in the waiting room, 
Um, you should make sure you have a good amount of clinical staff doing constant rounds and monitoring out there, vital signs, pain checks, anything that's within their license that they could do, depending on who's out there. Um, that's the things that you would need to do in a waiting room uh, to make sure that you don't have any unnecessary risk out there. But I do like the hallway bed methodology. I know uh, big ERs use them. Uh, so make sure that you use all of your hallway beds. You know, obviously you fill your rooms first, your hallway bed second, and then um, patients would potentially have to wait in the waiting room. The low acuity strategy model or fast track, a lot of folks have this as well. This is um, typically something I would recommend to take a look at, even if your organization has it, what are your metrics related to it? Fast track, really patients should be in and out of your ER in 60 minutes. 60 minutes is really the, the gold standard, so to speak. It's hard to get them out in 60 minutes, but fast track patients should really be your low acuity, which means they're your um, ESI triage levels four and five. So they're coming in with colds, earaches, um, medication refills, things like that. Some really simple things. Um, these aren't, you know, your abdominal pains and things like that. Those are your higher acuity patients. But you really need to have a special, um, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be space, but a team dedicated to fast track. You need to have your nurses assigned to fast track. You need to have a provider assigned to fast track. And you really need to keep that area pretty clean of anything else that might get in the way. So I know that um, in one of the previous hospitals I was in, it's, it's pretty hard to be like, oh, I've got an abdominal pain and they're vomiting out in the waiting room. And I, it's a level three, but I think I can put it over in fast track. Nope, don't do it. Try and keep it as clean and simple because even though you're really helping that one patient, it causes this snowball effect for all of your other times and, and um, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with your other uh, patients that are there. So fast track, you still wanna um, be able to maintain, you know, I think I saw a question about uh, ratios. You should be able to take care of four or five fast track patients pretty easily. So maybe you have a 10 bed fast track, you might have a couple nurses over there, you want a provider over there, uh, tech over there. Um, and remember saving time, saves space, it saves clinical time, et cetera. So even though fast track can come off as counterintuitive to those that work in the emergency department. Um, I know a lot of those folks wanna take care of the really sick and, and they wanna say, oh, it's an emergency. This is what we wanna take care of. Fast track patients has to be a priority to keep the rest of your hospital and your ER as, as cleaned up of space and time as you can. So this is a methodology that I would always recommend as your first one to look at when, um, if we would ever come in and do an assessment. And your triage nurse is typically the nurse that pushes the patient into fast track. So when the patient has arrived and they're quick regged and triaged, if the triage nurse lists the patient as a four or a five, that means they're low acuity on the ESI model, they should automatically go into the fast track area. And so that might mean, you know, building um, from a clinical EHR perspective, something different and things like that. So the nurse is the one who pushes that patient into fast track. Um, looking at the uh, long turnaround times, I had mentioned a little bit of that. You want to look as maybe an ER director or a clinician in, in the department, what are your turnaround times with lab and radiology based on certain tests? Um, are those areas that could be cleaned up, so to speak? You know, what are the root causes of some of those slow turnaround times that really might be uh, causing a patient's length of stay to be even longer than it should? Is it taking 30 minutes for a, for a lab tech to, or a flebo to draw the blood after the order's been dropped. And then when it goes to the lab, how long does it take it to spin and get a result? And then how, how long does it take to get Those are the things that you can break down step by step to get their overall turnaround time. That would take, um, you know, collaborating with the leadership in those departments. But if you do that and you set some goals, you can typically see some really, really good improvements um, in both your lab and radiology departments when it comes to your ER. 
Now your boarding and your EV holds, um, again, this is, this is a, a tough one. Uh, boarding is frustrates everybody that works in an emergency department, the clinicians, the providers, everybody. Um, if you're in a big ER, you could have 20 to the last ER we were in had 90 holds typically a day, or right around there, 70 to 90. And they were a 65 bed ER. So you can imagine that every, every bed was full before their day even started. So when that happens, you have to think about your, um, your, what your ER looks like, the physical space. So you have the back, which what most ERs call all of your treatment area. It's behind triage, so to speak, even though remember triage is not a place. Um, and then you have all the patients arriving. It's really an hourglass. So you have the front end, you have triage, then you have the back end. Well, if the back end is full before the day starts, that means you have to bring everything you got out to the front end. All, a lot of work has to be done outside of the true kind of back end. You need to be able to pull nurses out there, techs, your providers. You almost have to forget that your borders exist when you're still trying to run an ER. You'd like to think that your borders have nurses assigned to them for the day. I don't recommend giving your ER nurse borders and ER patients, that creates inefficiencies alone. So give your four border patients, your five border patients to a nurse and leave them in the back and move as much of your ER processes to the front as, as you can. That's really the only way you can manage your department. You run out of space still, but um, is to leave your borders in the back with those that are caring for them, assigned to them. Um, typically from a provider perspective, they've been handed off to cardiology, ortho, your hospitalist, whatever have you. Um, so your ER docs can really come out front as well. Um, so to, to really talk a little bit more about that and how to mitigate that is you could come up with a uh, surge plan. So you should have some sort of surge plan for your organization and your emergency department. So, you know, when those patients 10 are standing, uh, walking in the door together, you know, they're not related. This is not a mass casualty. This is just a bunch of folks have arrived at the same time. You need to have a plan for that. It shouldn't be one person in triage going through the list one by one, no matter if it's calling your charge nurse out, um, things like that. You want to make sure that you're, you have a plan for that. And then um, the the organization should have a surge plan as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, you can implement scorecards. Scorecards can be, I have hit listed here in the slide, specific to providers. Um, you can talk about left without being seen on a provider shift, um, do their door to dock times, door to decision time. Providers, uh, specific scorecards can give you great insight into who's moving at a, a speed that you're expecting versus not. This doesn't have to be limited to providers. There's lots of different timestamps and elements that could be put into a nurse scorecard as well. So um, keep that in mind. These types of data elements are, are really helpful when you're trying to move metrics. We talked again about incidental improvement with left without being seen. As you improve your timestamps, your length of stay, those types of things, all of your risk will really start to go down and a, and a lot of it will happen incidentally. Looks like we're at a polling question, Amy. All right, so our second poll is, do you have an organizational surge capacity plan? Yes, it works great. Yes, but it needs some help. No, or unsure or not applicable. And then just a reminder, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions uh, to receive CPE credit. So we still have two more before the top of the hour. And then your organization might not call it surge capacity, might call it something similar, but if your hospital's really busy or your ER is really busy, what? What is your procedure called? Do you have it? Does it work? All right, here are the results. 
Looks like yes, it needs some help and unsure, not applicable, understood. So let's talk just a minute about this. Um, so an organizational surge plan really uh, is put in place by an emergency department. You can use what's called a NEDOCS cal or calculator, national, or national Emergency Department Overcrowding Score is what it's called. You can do this manually or perhaps your EMR, your EHR uh, comes up with this calculation. But if your emergency department is at capacity, you have critical patients, et cetera, et cetera, down there, the entire organization can go into their surge capacity plan procedure. And, and typically what that means is you're gonna, you're, the hope is to get some additional help. So if you're in the black or even the red, uh, laboratory and radiology, even the nursing areas would have some specific steps they put in place to, um, to help the emergency department. So I would encourage you to take a look at how the rest of the hospital could help the emergency department when they're at their busiest. Pat, I'm gonna pass it to you for borders and productivity. All right, great. Um, so we know that um, a couple of the attendees mentioned that borders is kind of top of mind and it's definitely something that is that we're seeing more and more EDs are faced with. You're just having a lot of hold, you're having a lot of borders. And so as you contend with this, one, one thing is also that you are also appropriately accounting for these borders in your in whatever metrics you're using to keep track of this, whether it's hours and also how it impacts your productivity. So there's several different standard methods to account for borders as it relates to productivity. And um, the ENA, the um, Emergency Nurses Alliance, has a couple methodologies that they recommend. And all of this is to to make sure that your providers are getting credit for the borders that you um, they are seeing, and we have um, we definitely there are different ways to do it. We've generally recommended the modified visit method, but they kind of all lead to the same approach. And one, and we we stress the importance of doing this because data is how you make the you're making decisions on your ED, whether you're as a CFO or as an ED director. But if you're not operating with the right information, it's gonna hurt a lot more than it helps because it might end up that you're overinflating your visit counts, you're underinflating your visit counts. And in the end, what it shows that you're not, you don't have an accurate look at how your ED productivity truly is. So what we're seeing here is what we, when we had a, we want to see a client, one of our clients, was saying that um, based off our interviews that they have so many ED holds that they are, their ED is constantly slammed. They're asking for more staff. They can't seem to get staff. What's happening? And so we kind of dug into the data. What they were reporting was that they're operating at four hours per patient visit, which is, which is high, but it didn't seem to make sense given what we were hearing from our interviews with the staff on the floor. So we dug into the data and then realized that what was happening is that they haven't, their, their border hours were getting exponentially higher. You can see in this orange line going up there, but they were using an outdated methodology to account for their visits, which was resulting into them over um, almost double counting their visits, which was deflating, um, under adjusting their productivity. And so once we, when we went in, took a look, realized their billable visits were almost half of what they were adjusting for, applied the correct methodology to it. We realized that what, what they were thought that they were operating at four hours per patient visit, they were actually operating closer to eight using ENA methodology. And so this, that seemed, that kind of matched a lot more what we were hearing and realized like, okay, well, borders were affecting their ED, but there's a lot more that was happening under service that we needed to address. And so anyway, this leads to our next polling question, Amy. All right, thank you, Pat. So the third polling question is, which area do you believe your organization needs to focus on first to address your emergency department challenges? And your options are triage, door to dock times, fast track, um, borders or unsure, not applicable. And you do have the option to submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. 
Uh, we do have quite a bit of content to still cover uh, today, so if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. All right, we'll leave this up for a few more seconds here. And here are the results. Orders is um, looks like it's still the the highest there after unsure, not applicable, um, and that that certainly is uh, still common. I answered a question in the chat, uh, just that there's. Uh, you know, obviously, when there's no beds and, and patients are, are stuck down in the ER, what are my thoughts? Um, I would do a little bit of digging into um, those that are doing the admissions. Have you kept data on the admitting physicians? So perhaps you have a group that's over admitting that you could do some breakdown on that and do some continued discussions and education with them. That would be the first step that I would take a look at. Make sure that you're kind of still hitting the, the national benchmark for admissions from your ER. So um, I'm not really gonna go into these. I just wanted to add them because I know that they're, uh, these are supportive things that can happen in your emergency department. And perhaps if you're a good size, you are using those. Uh, security, security is, um, if I'm going to go in an emergency department and take a look around, security is going to be one that I'm going to uh, I'm going to probably talk to. I'm going to ask them a few questions. Um, we know that there's a lot of violence in emergency departments, and there's a lot of uh, legislature that's going on in regards to um, security and some new laws in in regards to um, healthcare workers. So security should be very active in a good size emergency department. Clinical decision support, and what I mean by this is, you know, how is your IT system helping your end users? Um, are they getting pop-ups? Are they being used effectively if the pop-ups really exist? Are they uh, getting burdened by them? Things like that. There should be teams looking at this and making sure that your um, EHR is functioning the way it should be and not overburdening or under or not giving them enough information. And then telehealth. Um, certainly telehealth is uh, really, really growing. It's obviously still uh, st even growing in your emergency department. Um, we're seeing it more frequently with behavioral health, high risk uh, pregnancies, things like that, where there might not be an expert on site in that uh, emergency department or even that community. So telehealth is something that is very common these days and I, I do believe will continue to grow. So our approach, Moss Adams, if we were to come into your hospital, um, first thing we would do is uh, collect data. You know, obviously I've talked a lot about data here. You can't make decisions or, or strive for improvements unless you know your benchmarks and, and some of the timestamps that are needed to really make improvements. So I wanna collect a lot of data and I wanna interview some of the staff and your leaders. Um, and then I'm gonna wanna come into the department. I'm gonna wanna observe your triage. I wanna take a look around, look at how you're using your waiting room, your hallway beds, things like that. And then we'll uh, break out and develop some teams to review this data and, and um, suggest some changes. Now, our changes aren't always, or, or um, some of the ideas that we may have might not fit your organization and that's okay. Typically there will be different ideas and um, if the Moss Adams team has been in your ER and, and can take a look around, we could obviously um, help by maybe suggesting a different methodology. So um, happy to do any of that. And then when we um, help you implement some of the changes, we'll work side by side. We'll stay there. Um, we'll come on site whenever we need to. We'll help run some sub teams. We'll help um, coach leadership if needed, work with providers. Um, any of those things uh, to, to implement um, the suggested changes. And then we'll continue to make improvements and create sustainability in any way that we can. Okay. Pat, you want to talk just about quick. staffing quick? Yeah, of course. So just wanted to go through this quickly as an example of what we do when we work with you with you and your ED is that one of the one of the models that we do is a staffing to demand grid because often we see that daily staffing and throughput optimization are the main opportunities for ED productivity improvement. But so we kind of go in to see how 
how your ED is operating at every hour of the day. We do this through and we model this for every day of the week. And what this is, what serves to do is just to help either confirm what we've already been seeing in the workflows or really just help to uncover kind of other areas of opportunity that were not immediately evident before. Like, why is it that between noon and 8 p.m., it seems like the staffing is a bit more mismatched compared to the, the whale tail, as we call it, of the demand. And so this is kind of an example of what we do. Um, and we take, and we always make sure to take into account your organization's needs and contacts and create solutions in tandem, in partnership with your ED staff and stakeholders so that the, the recommendations we make are applicable, actionable, and sustainable. Thanks for that, Pat. Um, so I'm gonna take one of the questions I see that popped up here, um, and that's a really good question. How do you gain inpatient support when you are boarding patients? Um, what strategies are helpful? Uh, you see that as a struggle a lot in organizations, and I know that inpatient areas um, and EDs often uh, butt heads, if you will, on the timeliness of taking patients. Uh, this strategy, the best strategy is to involve your inpatient nurse managers and directors. There's also timestamps and other things that you can kind of ascertain from, from your charts and you can pull reports and stuff like that on the time the patient was ready to leave the ER to the time the patient arrived on the floor. There's metrics related to that. So um, you can definitely take a look at that, work with your inpatient groups and set some standards and some boundaries on that. Um, so again, going back to working with your team, we'd be happy to come in and review any quality initiatives. We take a thorough review of your productivity, your FTE review, any of your metrics, um, triage process, uh, charge nurse duties, any of those things we would uh, do as we worked with your team. This is a case study, Pat and I and other Moss Adams members, we've worked together. We've made some really great improvements um, in some of the hospitals we worked at. In one of the last hospitals where I worked in the Midwest, we had some really great improvements in the emergency department. Um, with improved efficiencies, perhaps you can uh, reduce your FTEs. And that doesn't mean uh, cutting staff or anything like that. It just means perhaps your open positions, knowing that you're probably not fully staffed, were reduced. So some of these efficiencies come with some, some FTE uh, savings. Uh, fast track, ED holding time, patients discharged in under 10 minutes, all of those things we've had success with um, over the past couple of years. Last polling question. All right, thank you. So the last poll is how well would you describe your emergency department's performance? We're doing well, uh, we're measuring our metrics and are working on improving our performance. We're in triage mode, we need help or unsure or not applicable. And while you're responding, uh, for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. We're also sending them via email tomorrow along with a recording of this webcast. All right, a few more seconds. Make sure to hit submit so you get your CPE. And here are the results. Measuring our metrics, working on improving our performance. That's great. It's, it's good to at least uh, start with knowing your metrics, setting some goals, working with others throughout uh, your organization to do that so that our patients and our staff get the best benefit they can. So um, with that, thank you so much. I think we covered most of the questions that uh, were listed. If we didn't for some reason, we'll certainly get back to you, but we appreciate all of the time that you spent with us today. Back to you, Amy. All right, thank you, Don and Pat for a great presentation today. And to our audience, if you have further questions or comments, please reach out to us and we would be happy to continue this conversation 
You can drop a note in the Q&A window or reach out to Pat and Don directly. Their contact information is in the console um, as well as in the slide deck, which you can download now from the handouts window. And we do have our conference our healthcare conference coming up uh, next month in Las Vegas. The image in the upper right hand corner will take you to more details and registration does close tomorrow. So if you've been putting that off, uh, now's the time to do it. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And then finally, here's a link to a survey for today's presentation. Your feedback is always appreciated. And thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.